and welcome to Morris Park. Are you ready, folks? Probably wondering what I mean by, are you ready? Right now it's fall. We've already had freezing temperatures down to 22 degrees. In fact, this last week, the first part of the week, we had temperatures uh, ranging from 28 to 22 degrees at night. And that's a hard freeze for us. And that's Fahrenheit. So, it's that time to get ready. And what I mean by getting ready is your heating systems. Are they ready? Now, of course, if you live in a warm climate, say out in Southern California or uh, in Arizona, of course, in Arizona I've seen it snow too, or say Florida or somewhere like that, you're probably not as worried about any of this because it's going to be pretty warm and your winter temperatures aren't really going to harm what you have. Now here, we have to be ready. And when I mean ready, that means going through a checklist of things like um, my stove, Stove has to be ready, and what I usually do is take uh, the switch plate off the thermostat. We've got a few mosquitoes in here. Switch plate off the thermostat, check it, and what I usually do there is take, jump a wire over the thermostat to see if the motor's going to be running. See if that motor's still good. Make sure, because you don't want a surprise when it finally gets down cold, and then <clears throat> you have a problem. So I've done that. That's working. I've taken and uh, already run the stove now. I ran it on a halfway cool day that wasn't so urgent and um, found the thermostat's fine. Those mosquitoes again. Found the thermostat is fine and so it's, it's running. The stove is good. The other thing I've made sure I have uh, ready is two generators. I've got two generators because we have one for the house and one for this greenhouse. Now being that I burn wood you're probably wondering, why do I need a generator if i got a wood stove? Well, here's the thing. Just because I have a wood stove doesn't mean that heat just flows in and heats this place by itself. This is a big outdoor wood stove, and the heat actually has to be blown in. So it has an electric blower. So I've made sure on all this, and that's fine. Um, we're good there. And also, uh, on our generators, I had both of them gone over and repaired this uh, um, summer here. In fact, the last one just a couple weeks ago and make sure they're both running. So if any power goes out, then we do get ice storms here that'll take our power. The last ice storm we had here that was bad, bad, shut us down for six days. And we had to run things off of a generator. And it was, uh, it was that was when we learned about generators and having to have one and needing one so badly. But having generators to back up your power if it goes out, because you don't want to lose all this <clears throat> if you put all these years into it and, and have it go away. Well, these mosquitoes are just relentless. So anyway, I've done that, got the generators uh, up, heater's good, also my fuel supply. And uh, I've made sure, and I'll show you this here in a minute, that I have a sufficient fuel supply for now. I have more wood that uh, I need to prepare. And what I mean by preparing is splitting. I have to take this wood out of big chunks and split this up. A lot of times I cut my own wood. Um, just recently I had uh, my great nephew uh, Mr. Frank Herbis drop off some large chunks of maple and I stopped to split that, but that's another thing. Your other equipment. Uh, do you use a big 12 pound uh, old school maul or do you use a log splitter? I uh, last year had to use a 12 pound maul because my log splitter uh, went down, had carburetor issues, and I wasn't able to get it fixed right away. So right now it's in the shop, right now I'm getting fixed. I had it worked on about a week ago and they cleaned it up a little bit, but it just didn't do it. So they're going to have to put a new carburetor on it. So I'm getting that done right now. So I have uh, something to split that uh, wood with. I've already got a bunch of it split and uh, stacked up. I'll tell you what, these things are bad. A bunch stacked up. <clears throat> I think the mosquitoes are enjoying my warm greenhouse. Now, I've already used that stove for about three nights this week because it was very cold down the 20s. But now it's warm back up. So it's kind of like a summer day again. It's uh, in the uh, high 70s to uh, 80 the last couple of days. Greenhouse has been getting pretty warm. In fact, on the last cold night, the day actually warmed up afterwards pretty warm. So my greenhouse got really warm, about 90 degrees, because the stove was running too. And there's no real way to regulate the stove like you would an electric heater or something like that. The thermostat works totally different. So the, the hot air just comes in and uh, kind of warms it up anyway. Also, uh, you want to kind of look around and see 
What's going to need watering, what's not? Now, a lot of you, if you live in colder areas, are going to stop your watering pretty soon, and especially if you live in a humid area. Uh, living in a humid area is a lot more dangerous to your cactus and succulents if it gets cold, and so a lot of you will just shut off the water right now. Now, me, I was really preparing to shut off the water and had for a lot of things. Um, some of the things have actually lost some of their leaves and everything, uh, but I'm probably going to have to water some again because, like the other day, I walked into the greenhouse, it was 90 degrees. Uh, because I have the windows all shut and everything, and the fan covers on, and my uh, ventilation fan, that was another checklist thing. Make sure I have my ventilation fan covered. Um, I only run the ventilation fan during the summer, of course. And I have to have it sealed off in the winter, so a panel goes over it over the winter. So this greenhouse is pretty well tight and closed up. <clears throat> and it got pretty warm. So things have dried out, and they've really shown a lot of uh, signs of doing so. And although I don't want these full of water during the winter, Right now, if it's real warm, I want them to have a, a good watering and not to just totally dry out before they really need to dry out. Gotcha. So, I'm probably going to water at least one more time. Some of these things I can tell they're kind of wilted down. They're going to go to sleep. And so I probably won't touch them anymore because they're just not going to need it. Um, so anyway, I'm going to take you around, show you what's going on um, in the greenhouse. Show you what's happening outside a little bit first and show you how far into fall we actually are. Okay, as you see, we have a real windy fall day today. A lot of leaves are already done. Uh, trees have pretty much dropped them. And that freeze pretty well took care of that. As you can see, our mimosa trees pretty much just released all their leaves. They're still green, but that happens after a freeze. We get a good freeze, and that's when the mimosa trees lose everything. They lose all those leaves. But as you can see, we're well into fall. We're headed towards winter. You can see the freeze kind of took care of the crab apple tree, too. You can see the leaves are all wrinkled up. This crepe myrtle, too. You can see the leaves are just burnt off of it. They're just dead and, dead and ready to fall off now. So we're well into fall. This next week we're supposed to get good warm temperatures, um, 70s and upper 70s actually. And so we ought to be pretty good there. And so I won't need too much uh, fuel over the next week. But this is what I got to do here. This is a large chunky maple that I'm going to have to split. A lot of wood here. Big chunky wood. I mean, that's a big piece of wood. Anyhow, when I get my log splitter fixed, I'll have this all split up. I already have uh, some of it split. What I could do by hand using an old school 12-pound uh, maul, which that's uh, a little bit rough. Some of this wood gets pretty hard, so it's hard to split it. But I've got lots of wood I cut over last year and all. So I got a pretty good pile. My tarp over it over here. This goes back quite a bit. So there's a lot of wood sitting here. But you know, this winter, I'm probably going to go through this. So I'll need to split up this other wood, get it stacked up, and actually cut some more just to be sure. You don't want to run out. That's the one thing. You don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're going to run out of wood or run out of fuel. So make sure you got fuel. If you heat with propane, make sure your propane tank is heated, is uh, filled up, not heated up, but filled up, excuse me, and ready to go. Make sure your uh, stoves, whether they're propane, electric, or wood, are ready to go. That way you won't get caught in a bad situation. You don't want that. Now right here, <clears throat> I've got some of the smaller wood and some of the wood split up already. I kind of transferred over here next to my stove. And this is what's going to heat my greenhouse this uh, winter. And I always like to check to make sure I have some here. If something happens where I don't get home from work on time and uh, Deb gets home before I do, she can throw a couple sticks of wood in there to keep that uh, fire going. Normally what I do when I load this stove, I load it 6 o'clock in the morning. Then when I get home from work, it'll probably be around 5 o'clock or so. Then about 10 o'clock, I stuff it full again. 
And then about six o'clock again, the, the, the whole process repeats. So, I gotta be on top of things. This one won't run by itself. I have to feed this. And it works pretty well, as long as you can keep up with it. It is a little bit of work, but we kind of work for what we love. So, I make sure this is going good. And can heat my greenhouse. Now here, is a little panel I was telling you about where the thermostat is. And back behind there, what that does is the cabinet of the stove heats up. As soon as the hot air comes through the vent and just starts rising, then that thermostat will cut on and start blowing the hot air through at 120 degrees. It's worked pretty well for me. And that's what I've been keeping my greenhouse with ever since I've uh, come to the Ozarks here from Southern California. And everything I do to get ready is all for this. I'll keep this greenhouse of mine alive and growing well and not uh, die out just because, well, I didn't get ready. So you always want to be ready, folks, because you never know what can happen. Here in the Ozarks, the weather can change rapidly. I'm going to show you some of my plants here. Euphorbia hybrid. It's a horrid uh, polygonal hybrid, actually. Eucarii. Horrida powder blue cultivar. Eucarii varspirostitia. The old var major, Horida. Got a lot of Horidas. You can see. Also, a lot of these uh, crested lactea crests. This one really grew a lot this summer. This uh, white lactea here. As well as this one. This is my speckled tricolor. They gained a lot of uh, growth this summer. They seem to like that hot, hot, hot temperatures we had. Yep. Seriformis. Granny Waldii. Polygon over there. Maclensis. Ruganosa. I probably won't name everything here, but some of them are worth noting. This is my Euphorbia Enigma. This is my greenhouse made hybrid. Pollinators made this between a Stellata and this big Evansi eye here. My Evansi eye tree. Now, pretty soon I'm going to have to release the king. He's got the last rope left on it. And I think it's grown rather well because this summer. It did show growth. It actually grew leaves. You can see some of the leaves dying back now. So it has shown growth. I've kind of shook on it and it makes the whole pot rock now. So it's well rooted. Nice euphorbia pulpinata. It'll be losing its leaves soon. And a curious thing about it, you can see down in there, you can see some little flowers starting to uh, develop. This one flowers as it's going to sleep. So as it's losing its leaves, it'll actually start blooming. So you Richard Zay, you form your Richard Zay. This is a uh, Euphorbia, what they call a Super Variegata. It is a uh, Mayor Nathan I hybrid cultivar given to me by. Uh, Daz and Edith, Cactomania. It's just lost its leaves. Leaves just dried up, but it's like doubled in size now. Doing real well. Things are looking pretty good. I'm gonna watch myself here. Those mosquitoes are really relentless. They kind of chewed me up here a bit. Bocasana, the two colors. This one isn't in bloom right now, but the Rosa Flora is. Euphorbia brevitorta. <laughs> My big old moon cactus. 
They kind of exploded last year and lost some of its uh, offsets on this side. My Cephalosarius Sinilis. Had that quite a while. Probably about, oh, 34 years, probably. A lot in here. My lemon tree. A little yellow right now. The heat of summer really kind of got to it. My Lelia Catalea. Full bloom. This is the time of year for it. Never disappoints. It always blooms nicely. Let's look at some of the upper levels here. It's a Grissonia. You just call them a Corinapuncha. And this type, particular type is from uh, Baja, California. We also have types of these that grow in California, Arizona, and New Mexico. The ones in Arizona and California are quite a bit smaller. They're like a little mini club choya. That's basically what they call them, the club choya. Echinopsis chocolate has been growing rather well. Pterocactus tuberosus, which I got from Daz and Edith also, has grown really well. Grown a lot of offsets. Puncha ficus indica seedling. My little theory on this, they grow so tall like this. It's been the full sun. They grow so tall to make the tree first. And there's a big growing cactus. I got this one from uh, Lynn and Hans. Lynn of Desert Plants of Avalon and Hans, the plant daddy. And I think they grow this kind of rounded trunk and then finally they start to fill out on top and get the flat pads. That's my theory anyway. <laughs> little Paul Venata. Amelia prolifera. Got a couple of monodames back there. A Lugarde. Another one that Dazzini has sent me back here. Richard's A. I mean, not a Richard's A. Uh, excuse me. I forgot right now. Richie Eye. That's what it is. Yay. <laughs> that's a Monodenium Richie Eye variegata. It's already losing its leaves. Still fat and uh, chubby, though. This is my little round hanging. Uh, shelf here. These are trichocereus seedlings that started by themselves in my greenhouse. <clears throat> I had a trichocereus uh, die from a heavy rain we got one day. I left out one day and a heavy rain just killed it. Had a fruit on it though right before it died and I'd set it aside in a pot. Forgot about it. And I was watering one day a few months later and these were all growing in the pot. They've come out rather well. They're kind of different shapes and so forth, but that happens with hybrids. You'll get some uh, different variation. No spirus ditcha. A little tephrocactus, articulatus, and nermus. Spruce cones. Had that nice piece on top there, but I just barely touched it the other day and it <laughs> broke right off. These things are just like glass, I swear. I touch them, they break off, or look at them hard, they break off. This is my little uh, variegated Euphorbia submammillaris that I caged up. It was laying all over these other guys, so I had to kind of give everybody some room. This is my Jatropha. And it's starting to lose its leaves. This is Jatropha podogryca. Still got some flowers on top, as you can see. But... This time of year, it starts yellowing down and dropping its leaves. I might give it one more watering, just because things have been so hot in here. That's going to be about it. Deb's rose tree over there. We cut it back real hard this year, and it really came out nice. Actually, it started to grow real well and, and bloom out. Horova Echinopsis up there, different varieties. So Denudata and the other ones, I'm really not sure about which ones they are. Agave attenuata. Now, I must confess, I've had this one 38 years. I got it the day we, I think the day, yeah, the day we left California, I got this one. Um, I have to confess, we had some big apartment buildings around from where I lived. 
just right around the corner in a little parking lot where we used to park our car. These you all faced it, and there's a huge bed of them. And so I took off with just a little cutting about like that. In fact, actually two cuttings that were just like that. And that's these two big ones now. Sorry, guys. I had to steal your little uh, agaves there. <laughs> but anyhow, as far as I know, they're not even there anymore. They've removed everything from the pictures I've seen. This is a monodenium guntheri. This is still pretty leafy. It's finished up blooming for now. A mm, few left. It's still fairly leafy. Little command series up there. I'm trying to keep this command series up here because I'm hoping that maybe, just maybe, the spider mites won't get to it. These things, I swear, if there's a spider mite within 100 miles, it, it's just attracted to them. And here's a whole hanging shelf full of uh, plants. My Cordycanthus viviparas, which I uh, really love. Got this summer. Finally, I think I've identified this one I bought at the Amish store this last spring, and I believe it's an Echinocereus. I'm not exactly on the sure type, but I'm pretty sure that's an Echinocereus. I'll know for sure when it blooms. A Houdia. I kind of put these hanging shelves in to uh, give a little more space in my greenhouse. I can have a little bit more. <laughs> Something else I've done this year, and this is prepping too. Let me get down here. This is all in the prepping. See this column here? It's got plants hanging off it. Well, on the other side, it's a cedar trunk. I put that in right when we built this and used to hang things off the cedar trunk because it looked pretty cool. But recently, I got some scrap uh, crate wood from work and built these beams. In fact, see the tire tracks? That's actually from a forklift <laughs> running over the busted down crate and uh, the wood we had piled up. A little Euphorbia Enormous hanging off there. I've also done it over here. Now I've done this because my greenhouse is over 20 years old now. And they were kind of predicting that we might get heavier snows this winter so I decided to take this expanse this wide expanse here and break it up and give some support down into the floor where it wouldn't uh, cave in on me I, I, that'd be a horrible 